I'm always amazed by how scientists and engineers outsmart the natural world. One thing that may happen is that you're targeted to a specific goal, but you may end up doing something else. <laughs> so if you observe something that looks promising, you have to be able to take it. Hamilton Smith's initial work that led to the Nobel Prize was restriction enzymes. And that allowed uh, manipulation of DNA, which opened up a whole new field of cutting and cloning and analyzing DNA and sequencing DNA. Being able to take an organism and say, what's its blueprint? That's an entirely new way of thinking and led to the Human Genome Project. I wanted to ask you a little about the um, recent paper that's just been published online with uh, Craig Ventner about the synthetic cell. So this right. was a large technical challenge, it seems, to just make the DNA yes. of this size. Yeah, it's, it's a technical achievement. There will be a lot of science coming out of the applications of what we've done, but right now it's a technical achievement to put together 1.1 million base pairs correctly from starting with just a sequence and synthesized with four chemicals, A, G, C, and T. Uh, we're here today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell, a cell made by uh, starting with the digital code in the computer, uh, building the chromosome uh, from four bottles of chemicals, assembling that chromosome in yeast, transplanting it into a recipient bacterial cell and transforming that cell into a new bacterial species. This is the first self-replicating species that we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. So would it be fair to say that you downloaded the genetic code and printed it on a very expensive printer to make a big molecule and yeah. plugged it into the cell <laughs> right. like, and then booted it up? Yeah, that's right. Craig likes to say that we've been sequencing genomes, now we're writing them. Wow. <laughs> so for individuals that might be worried that you're creating a new bacteria that has new and different properties, what would you say about... Uh... I would say not to worry. <laughs> well, what we've done now is simply to make some minor changes in an existing organism. It's not dangerous to humans. We can work in the laboratory quite safely with it. It's also a very delicate organism. If I put some out in the grass here, it would die. Uh -huh. It only lives in, yeah. in goats. So if, uh, yeah, goats should be worried, but not me. Yeah. Or not even them so much. <laughs> and they shouldn't be worried because we can treat it. <laughs> yeah. How did you come about with the idea of building a synthetic cell? Was it uh, uh, just to strip it down, or did you, uh, do you want to create more complex structures as well, or do you want to make a, a factory to make biofuels one day? I think uh, once we have a minimal cell, we will want to start adding different uh, things to it to make it a more complex cell. For example, a pathway that would uh, make a useful fuel or a pharmaceutical product or whatever. He was interested very much in what I've been doing with synthetic cells. I think partly because he's trying to see how it might be helpful in his own work. What motivates us is almost the science fiction of uh, autonomous medical tools. Uh, Feynman talked about uh, surgical micro-robots that you could swallow the surgeon and uh, it would make decisions and cut out a cancer, things like that. So we're, we're trying to demonstrate some of the tools that may be useful to build some of these things. So we build little micro grippers that are about a millimeter in diameter that uh, start out flat and then when we want them to be triggered, they can trigger and grab something. And we've shown we can do little in vitro biopsies. So these are very small robotic things that would be introduced attached to a very thin wire. Well, that's what makes them very interesting. They're tetherless. 
Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So one of the, and this is, gets into some of the long-term challenges in making these sorts of things. We need them to either carry their energy on board or uh, be able to extract energy from the environment mm -hmm. in order to actuate. So the beautiful part is they're tetherless and we build them out of thin metal films and polymers. We can build nickel into them and nickel is magnetic and so we can control them outside with a magnet and move them around where we uh -huh. want. So I can bring it over to a place and then via a trigger I can actuate it. And what I've been leading is trying to get them to respond to biochemicals, to use uh -huh. biochemical intera uh -huh. interactions. Before we had to use heat or nasty solvents like acetone right. or acids or things like that to trigger them to uh, make this polymer change its properties. And what I've uh, just submitted for publication, what I've shown is that I can get them to respond to enzymes. If we can get it uh, incredibly selective to, to say, a disease marker, uh -huh. um, I think one of our dreams is maybe Then it could sense and move towards that thing. Once it found it, it would start operating. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's really, uh, it's getting incredible, I think. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, you know, I, we, we just, I work on it for months and you, you kind of lose sight of the fact that you're really working on something weird. With his latest work, it's a real technological feat. These are not uh, questions that seek to answer the fundamental nature of the universe or uh, whether things may be possible or not, but really about you know, if we want to do something, how do we go about doing it? And that relates to my work, because we have this science fiction dream that we want to turn into a reality. So I, I've often thought of um, what I do as falling into one of two slots. There's the type of scientists uh, or engineers that seek to understand things and those that uh, seek to build things. And it's a very different way of thinking in the lab. And it sounds like you're doing a bit of both. It's a little bit of both. I don't know what would be a good analogy. I always think of a car engine, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you can take it apart and put it together, I think you get a better understanding than just opening the hood. <laughs> yeah, that's, my parents told me that was my childhood story of taking things apart and putting them together. The difference, I always had parts left over, so I don't <laughs> yeah, know what yeah. that means. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> but, yeah, but things still worked, so I guess yeah. they were non-essential. Well, there you are. You're leaving out non-essential parts. Yeah. You, you're already playing the game. Yeah, but I don't think I should be a surgeon. That may not, uh, <laughs> that may not be the way to go. <laughs> Feynman yeah. says, you know, what we cannot uh, create, we cannot understand. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we're taking that lesson. We're still at the stage of uh, fully understanding what nature has produced <laughs> at the cell level. And, and we're starting really with the simplest bacteria just like early molecular biologists started with the very simplest uh, viruses to study. We thought that if we go to a very small cell with a small genome, first of all, the genome was small enough that we could probably synthesize it. And then at some point we could uh, use our synthetic cell approach to build, synth synthetically build uh, a genome that's even smaller where we specifically leave out the genes that are not essential for growth in the laboratory. They might be essential for the growth in the environment, but under specific conditions in the laboratory, you can dispense with a lot of things. So taking well, the air conditioning out of the car and then the right. roof and seeing how little you can drive around. Yeah, so we want to uh, get down really just to the very basic machinery of the cell. So one thing I was thinking of is, is with the miniaturized tools that, that our lab is developing, right now they're uh, metals and polymers, but being able to integrate a, a living factory on it, if I could use the tool to guide itself to a site where there's disease and then have a, a, an engineered cell or an engineered factory to produce antibiotics or anti-cancer agents and turn it on just when I want, is for that example, something? For example, a, a toxin against a specific cancer. Absolutely. It could be transported that way. And that way you wouldn't be giving the toxin, the chemotherapy agent systemically and there'd be less side effects yeah. and you might be able to deliver it into a difficult area like deep inside the liver. Do you think that's something that one day, a technical challenge, uh, you know, we can put together the right parts and... Keep working on it. Okay. <laughs> it's, something I'll keep it's, thinking about. It's very exciting, yeah. I think uh, some of what Hamilton Smith does is similar to what uh, I do. I, I dream of a system. I say, oh, this should be easy, and in reality we find out it's difficult, and we have one technical challenge after another, but uh, 
it's, it's exploring the unknown uh, with a final goal of, of building something. I, I work in a very <clears throat> interdisciplinary lab. We have mm -hmm. chemists and physicists and engineers mm -hmm. and uh, electrical, electronics people. And everyone has a different uh, point of view. We get to a group meeting and you know, by the time the electrical engineer asks the chemist to explain the reaction, the chemist thinks of something new and <laughs> goes back downstairs and tries it out. Yeah, that's good. I think one of the most important things is to let students uh, conceive of their own ideas and be able to pursue them rather than being told to do something. So can I ask if, if would you consider yourself an engineer in practical terms and, and how you are building a synthetic cell? Uh, this is engineering. I'm glad to hear that as, as an engineer who works You're in, in the right field. <laughs> well, that's a fantastic thing to hear from you. I think it's very important that engineers are included in uh, worldwide scientific conferences and events like the Lindau meeting. And I'm very proud that there are a few engineers uh, like myself here because we, I feel that we really contribute to the development of science. We really uh, see everything as a problem to be taken apart and put back together and solved. And uh, if you get us engineers excited about something, we just love to play. Everything he's doing is new to me. I, I had no idea that people were working on this. Very interesting talking to him. Mm -hmm.